listening to the Really Useful Podcast. My name is Christian Corley, and this week we're doing things a little bit differently. Uh, it's just me with contributions from some of the regular team, but uh, we're looking back over some of our top moments, looking at specifically at DIY. So you can listen on in this show to find out the various ways you can build your own HD TV antenna. And you can do that with anything as small as a paperclip to build a huge wooden or metal based structure to mount on your roof. There's so many ways to do that. We'll also be talking about DIY computer desk projects. Some will be standard desks, some will be standing desks. We'll find out how to fix a scratched DVD. And we'll also be looking at the ways that you can remove one of those pesky, troublesome, broken headphone jacks from a phone or tablet. Joining me this week are Ian Buckley, Gavin Phillips and Ben Stegner, thanks to the magic of recorded media. These are clips from older, really useful podcasts. Let's kick off this week's show with a look at the various ways that you can build your very own HDTV antenna. Now, this is something that I tried uh, myself a few years ago using a great big plank of wood, 2x4, uh, eight metal coat hangers, uh, some uh, screws and washers, and I, I was amazed at how good the signal was, basically. Uh, oh, there's two disposable barbecue grills attached to it as well. Uh, I mean, it looks like a complete lash-up. Uh, but it works, and that's the thing. Now, I've been looking at this, uh, I've revisited this recently um, to find out. Uh, I knew there were some other ways of doing it, and I just got hold of one, which I would bring into the shop, but it's just out of reach, so I can't. I just got hold of a real one. It's a very compact little um, box. And I thought to myself, well, you know, this thing I made a while back was wood. This has come out of a factory. This is, like, quite compact. Uh can it actually get any smaller? So I've looked into this, and it turns out that, yes, it can get smaller. HDTV antenna can get smaller. Um, there's different ways of doing it. it. And, you know, you can ch check the link uh, for the details. But we're talking about card and foil and bits of glue, um, then wires and the attachments to the coaxial cable, uh, which... Uh, is a kind of uh, important aspect of it, but you don't necessarily have to have that because you just run the coaxial cable, um, strip it, and use the internal core and the external bit and attach those to it. But after saying all of that, it turns out that you don't even need to do that because if you are fortunate enough to live in the right areas, you can attach a paper clip <laughs> that's been unwound into an L shape like that attach that with a short end into the back of your TV and that is all that is needed. Now it does depend on your range and weather uh, between yourself and the transmitter but that, I mean, that's amazing that yeah. we're at this stage now that that will work. Yeah to be able to pick it up with that like tiny little paper clip it's just like a random piece of scrap sitting around your house to be able yeah. to pick up a signal from that is really cool and a good option if you don't you know, you don't you don't want to put an antenna on your roof, or you just recently cancelled cable or anything like the article talks about. Yeah, I think probably the best way to do, it, although you could put it back straight back in the the TV. I think the, probably the best way to do it is to run an extension up to some elevated point, maybe um, your, your loft space, sure, loft space, whatever, and then uh, plug it into the end of there. But uh, you know, when um, digital TV first came along, I'm, I'm I'm assuming it's the same in the US as it was over here. Uh, you know, it was a weaker signal than the uh, the analog signal, so it would be a lot harder. And obviously, you need to convert it, but it would be a lot trickier to get a good, strong signal without quite a large antenna. But now the analog signal has been switched off here in the UK, more, more or less switched off. There's small pockets which are still used, but it's more or less gone. And the digital TV signal is now stronger. Uh, you know, these things work. Yeah, it, it, I want to say it was the same here. Um, I I don't think I we had an analog TV at that time, so I don't 
Oh. I, I remember the transitions. I remember like my grandparents and a few other people that were using just a, a standard antenna. I think if you didn't switch over, it would just broadcast a message like you need to do this. But mm. yeah, it's, I mean, it's if you if you have an old TV that you're not using for anything else, it, just a little, fun little side project, if nothing else, stick a paper clip in. <laughs> See what happens. Uh, be careful, and obviously make sure you're attaching it to the right place. Right. Yeah. Uh, safety first. Safety first, absolutely. It actually you reminded me of um, the switchover thing. I had uh, a relative who lived in a small cottage, and basically they had a valley right in front of them, a hill behind them, and then at the other side of the valley, a hill. And here in the UK, up until 1982, we only had three terrestrial channels. And okay. because there was no satellite and no cable, we had three channels. Uh, and uh, my uncle could not receive the fourth channel that launched in 1982 because of where they were based. And this, as far as I know, is still the case today. Uh, without uh, satellite TV, they wouldn't be able to re- re- receive that fourth terrestrial channel, which you now streams to on satellites. Uh, whatever. So uh, landscape is an important part of terrestrial, whether it's digital or analog. Uh, so, you know, it really does depend on how far you are from the antenna and your location, whether or not that paperclip will work. But, the, you know, the other solutions outlined in that article, we have a, a card and foil solution and a fractal antenna, which is basically, I mean, that's foiled again, but with a different design and attached to a piece of uh, sort of flexible, transparent plastic. And, of course, my own... Uh, Attempts, uh, which I found online, and uh, I had to go myself the uh, an- the coat hanger antenna, as we call it. Uh, yeah, that's worth doing as well. Um, so please have a look at that link if you're interested in uh, getting yourself a low budget HD TV antenna, antenna, or as I say, if something has happened to your own antenna and you need to get uh, TV. Uh, I um, I don't live in a stormy area, then. So, I mean, is TV something that's important during storms for communications, or can you get away with radio? Um, I would say TV's not, like, vital. I mean, it's definitely a good option to have. I know we have, like, little emergency radios you can buy that'll just broadcast, like, you can listen to the weather. It's like a slider. One slider uh, is the weather, and the other one's, like, an emergency broadcast. So, um, I mean, I would imagine where I live, there's not a lot of not a lot of like natural disaster potential. Like we don't get hurricanes, no earthquakes and probably floods would be the only thing. So I think TV would definitely be a suitable option, but I don't think it would be like absolutely vital. Okay. Um, I think we've all heard of people who have attempted to repair aerials in storms though, haven't we? Oh yeah. And um, obviously it's not gone well. In fact, there was a, there's a famous entertainer. You won't probably won't be aware of him. because I don't think he was famous in the U S um, a guy called, uh, Rod's Hall, and uh, he died. Um, basically, his his um, his his uh, what we call turn was a he had a, a dummy emu, which is basically his arm was in the neck of this emu, and okay. then he had a false arm going over the side of the emu. So he'd run around carrying this emu, and the emu would basically assault people. That's what it was. It was basically it was all about the emu assaulting people. And, you know, you think, oh, that's not particularly funny. But um, the, the guy has such a good manner about him. It was, it just turned it. It was hilarious. Uh, for, <laughs> at his time, anyway. It's on YouTube. Go and have a look at it. It's funny. But um, this guy, who's a famous guy, um, went onto his roof during a football match, during a World Cup match uh, that England were playing in, and died trying to fix his aerial. Wow. So, yeah. So, yeah, not, not good. So, yeah, it's... Um, Safety first, definitely. And use the paperclip. If you can get away with the paperclip, use the paperclip. Uh, let us move on then, because... Uh... All of those methods are worth trying, but of course they are scalable so, and depend on the distance from your home to the nearest transmitter. Okay, we'll move on. And this, here's myself and in Buckley talking about the various ways that you can build a DIY computer desk and potentially save hundreds of dollars in the process. This one's quite close to my heart, this one. Yeah. <laughs> well, do you know I'm what? A big fan I, of it. The mm. last time I built a computer desk, uh, it's, um, it's well, I, I'm saying build. I didn't really build. Well, I kind of did, but I didn't. Basically, what I did, I had two. I had a desk and a filing cabinet mm. and 
a set of drawers and then I had two kitchen surfaces and I basically arranged things in the corner of a room and then put two kitchen surfaces on top of me and in the middle and I had a computer desk yeah that's and that's exactly what uh, various people I know have done they've got a yeah. kitchen surface and a couple of Ikea desks and that's and that's uh, that's the desk um, and it's something that is so widespread <laughs> uh, and it, it, it's almost it's almost difficult for me to say hey go and read my article now because yeah if you want to if you really want a cheap desk find a find a decent bit of wood and then something to stand it on if yeah. it has drawers in it all the better um, However, there was a few because I, I also have the same deal. I mean, my, my desk, um, my, my computer desk is a secondhand IKEA desk I just found on Craigslist. Um, but my working desk, so for when I'm doing DIY and Raspberry Pi stuff, is exactly that. I opted for something a bit higher because I stand when I do soldering work. Sure. So I have two large IKEA drawers with an old uh, shelf on the top of it. Um, and that uh, that works perfectly well for me. However, I will say one thing: it doesn't look particularly nice. Right. And that matters to a lot of people, especially sure. if this is going to be a desk in you know in in the main room of your house. And that's where some of these other designs come in. Um, the one of the things that's quite nice about the uh, some of the trestle desks. So, for those of you that aren't familiar with the the word, that's sort of like an A-frame. Um, uh, f more famously these days sold by Ikea they have an adjustable height A-frame and two of those obviously are they're like sawhorses you know they're, they're just two things that's freestanding and you can choose what to put on top of it uh, since they're made out of wood and they come in a, in a variety of colours and you can choose what you put on top of it they are sturdy enough to support pretty much anything outside of maybe a stone top um, they're movable and they look good enough to be say in your living room you know sure. Um and uh, th and that goes for a lot of the uh, you know a lot of the more nice looking ones. Um, uh, there's been a bit of a craze for a while for these steel pipe um, desks as well, which are put together essentially of old uh, iron piping for plumbing. Right. Uh, and uh, uh, there, th yeah, there's Pinterest pages abound of different designs for them because they're extendable. That's the ex exact point. Right. It's just pipe fittings, you know. Sure. Um. I mean, I would say if you are looking for, uh, it depends what you are looking for. I will say that because um, the real question when you're talking about DIY computer desks is should should you bother? Yeah. Is it worth it? Are you gonna uh, are you gonna save yourself uh, enough money by putting the time in to build it yourself, or should you just go and buy a cheap desk from say IKEA or whatever outlet store you have near you? You know. Um, and uh, what kind? Of, the other question is what kind of desk do you want? I mean. Yeah. The idea of a standing desk a few years ago seemed a bit weird. Now it's something that almost everyone that works in an office is aware of, if not, uh, you know, uh, seeing around them on a day to day basis. Because desks that you stand at for the health benefits, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, desks that you can adjust to sit or stand at. Uh, and you if you're going to make those DIY, then you're going to have to put a lot of work in and you're going to spend a little more money or you could do what the fella uh what was his name? The Brandon Keepers, who's a, a fellow who's part of uh, GitHub. Um, uh, he got two brackets, shelf, two normal shelf brackets and a decent sturdy bit of wood and then made a permanent stand up desk out of a shelf, essentially. Yeah. So that to me, I mean, if you've got a, a spare bit of wall space, that seems like a brilliant. That's that's, you know, I mean, he said it was forty dollars. If you've already got a bit of wood, that's less than a tenner. Yeah, yeah, for a couple definitely. of strong brackets and then you can sit at your desk and especially if you're someone that works on a laptop it's just it's a question of just start walking over the room you know yeah um i must admit i've for, for, for a long time now i've been uh i've uh, making a fully diy uh electrical probably counterweight but still electric uh stand up sit down desk has been a, a real thing i've wanted to do i just haven't found the time um there's some fantastic tutorials out there for them. I, um, you know, we, I mean, we've talked about IKEA a lot uh, on this topic. And, yeah. uh, you know, I've, I've done great things with uh, IKEA stuff in the past. I've built a Lego table with a five-pound table mm. and some Lego plates and uh, some uh, glue. Mm. Uh, I've done, you know, repurpose other bits of um, things like spice racks, bookshelves and things like that. But one of the things I really fancy having what i simply don't have the space for it 
is uh, the, the the motorized adjustable standing desk from IKEA. Yes. That that yep. big thing is it's an awesome table. Mm. Uh, basically, you could do so much at it with it, um, like DIY, baking, uh, crafting, all, all the yep. stuff like that. It, just, it seems it has so many possibilities, but it's so bloody big to get in my little house. Yeah. Which is, I think uh, that's yeah. the uh, that's the main thing, uh, and and it stands to reason really, especially if you're buying a commercial product, is that if uh, for the really big standing desks, for them to put um, uh, the the real thing uh, here, um, for for those that uh, aren't familiar with the idea, a standing desk is essentially uh, two actuators. That's what that's the moving parts in a standing desk, and actuators are basically motors on sticks that can take a bit of weight. That's yep. what they are. Um, if you're going to make a big standing desk, you're going to have to put some big actuators in it. Um, uh, and actuators are not the cheapest things in the world, which is why most of the standing desks you see, which are smaller, are not designed to take much weight. Uh, and to get one that does take a bit more weight, you're going to spend so much more on the actuators, you might as well sell a bigger desk because not that many people are going to be willing to spend up to a grand on a tiny little desk. You see what I mean? Sure. Um uh, you can do this yourself. You can buy actuators um, online. And in fact, the cost of them has dropped quite a lot. I was surprised. It's been a while since I looked at them. And I, uh, and again, one of the options in the list, uh, the article that I wrote um, is for someone that made it themselves. And I was pleasantly surprised. Um, you want, Having written the article and as, as a lover of DIY, if you want my honest opinion, if you really want a stand-up sit-down desk and you don't want a long period of testing and working it out, save up, make sure you've got the space and buy an electric stand-up desk. Hmm. Um, because if you're willing to put that le level of commitment into the space it needs and the money it costs, you'll probably get the best use out of it. Sure. So really anything can be used as a computer desk, can't it? Oh, yeah. Well, uh, one of the things in this article was the uh, the old idea, and it's a, a wonderful old story, that when Amazon was starting up, they couldn't afford desks, so they used doors. Sure. And yeah. uh, they stuck uh, feet on it. Um, I, I have to admit that the the idea of that does sound very romantic, doesn't it? Um, it does. <laughs> back I think in the day. Yeah, it depends on what sort of door it is, though, I suppose, as well. I well, mean, that's... A covered a door would be more practical than maybe a bathroom door. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you, you really don't want one of those, you know, one of those doors with all the dimpled bits of glass in it that yeah, you saw. Or all, the, or, all the, or all the sunken panels. And... Exactly. Yeah. And, and beyond that, even if you uh, even if you do have a completely smooth door, um, most internal doors of houses are made of a couple of thin bits of wood uh, with a, a essentially air in between. They don't yeah. need to be strong. And you don't want to be sticking a heavy computer monitor in one of those, no. um, which is so as much as the uh, uh, nice romantic idea of the Amazon um, uh, door desks is, you know, it's very nice to think, oh, when Amazon was starting out, they were a small company, they were saving money. Really, to get a solid door and to put legs on it, you're going to, you might as well buy a desk at that buy stage. A desk, yeah. Sorry, or at least yeah. buy a decent piece of wood and four legs and not call it a door, you know. Um, but either way. You can make it, you can absolutely make a computer desk out of anything. Um, and if you uh, spend a very small amount of time, um, just uh, even on YouTube, you'll find there are some fantastic plans for incredibly cheap desks for things you could get at your local Home Depot or B&Q or wherever your nearest uh, uh, hardware shop is. Um, so, yeah, if you want to oh. make, make a simple desk, get some wood and do it. If you want an electric stand-up sit-down desk, I'd suggest saving up and buying one. Sure. And we'll take a moment from our usual podcast proceedings to just remind you that the Really Useful Podcast can be found pretty much anywhere you find podcasts. So we're on Apple Podcasts, we're on Spotify, we're on Google Podcasts. We're hosted at Transistor.fm, so you can find us there as well. We're also on YouTube and, of course, on MakeUseOf.com. Now, however you subscribe to the Really Useful Podcast and listen to us, it would be amazing if you could take a moment to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. That will help us to find new listeners and take our podcast to ever greater heights. You'll find the link to our Apple Podcast page in the show notes. Thanks a lot. If you've ever come across a Scratch DVD, then you'll know or you'll expect it to be pretty much 
unplayable but there are ways you can fix a scratched dvd or cd-rom and potentially retrieve the data from it uh i do you know i have more or less stopped using dvd uh, sorry cd-roms for data and the only dvds i've got really sort of classic movies or classic tv shows that are sort of like re-released yeah um most of what i've got is either streamed or blu-ray i think uh yeah you know the advent of streaming services uh and also you know it did become drastically easier to actually upload your own videos to your computers you know and then storage is now phenomenally cheap compared to even five years ago really um you know you can get like a four terabyte hard drive for like under a hundred dollars in a sale which is you know more storage than most people ever need ever so um you can certainly make make do with that sort of thing absolutely however bearing that in mind it might be that you've got some old data that you need to get off an optical disc and onto hard disk and it makes sense and something that's going to get in the way of that is a scratched cd or dvd now it turns out that even a scratched cd or dvd you can get the data off it uh, optical drives can be persuaded to work using uh, several techniques the first thing you should do is clean the disc um, that is very important using a uh, soft lint free cloth and a tiny bit of detergent or rubbing alcohol if there's any grease on there um you can this is incredible but you can repair scratches on a damaged cd or dvd using toothpaste what <laughs> it's absolutely balmy. i know um it's it's toothpaste um it, the same technique can be used um with wax uh sort of furniture wax or lip balm basically what you do you put a small amount on the toothpaste onto a uh, a plate and then with a wooden t- toothpick you apply the filler along the scratch then rub with a suitable cloth and the idea is the laser can still penetrate and the um the refraction caused by or the distortion in the refraction caused by the scratch is reduced okay so it doesn't get stuck on that particular bit and that's it yeah it's going. that's the idea behind it wow um, and- that's not the only way. You can also use a light bulb. What? <laughs> hold the disc close to the close to a lamp for around 20 seconds, rotating the disc about 10 centimeters from the lamp, which is about four and a half inches. And this apparently softens the outer layer of plastic. Okay. And uh, you know that works. Now there's another thing with scratch CDs um, or with old CDs and old DVDs that is not. Per- perhaps not just scratches that cause the problems there's a thing called disc rot uh which causes the uh the 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 surface that holds the data usually a metal surface uh to rot away uh it's a kind it's not rust but you know it's it's something that happens to metal surface over time um that's been sandwiched between these um polycarbide surfaces and you can apparently now i haven't tried this but i'm reliably informed this does work uh, basically, you colour in the holes. What, uh, with like a crayon or a with a with a marker with a, a, a oh, sharpie, okay. that type of thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, cover the holes, thereby prompting the laser to keep reading. Because when it hits the holes, it'll just stop. Yeah. So you uh, use a piece of tape over each hole and then uh, mark it over with your sharpie. And this is on the reverse side of the disc, obviously the label side of the disc. Um, and it should then play. Uh, you'll be oh, able wow. to recover most of the data. Obviously, you won't be able to recover what's lost from you know the, the hole because that's gone. That's why it's a hole. Uh, but the rest of it, <laughs> you should be able to retrieve. The disc will not stop reading at the hole. It will carry on. Now, what do you do? You've got the disc. You can read the disc. How do you get the data off? Well, you can just copy it straight to your hard disk drive. That's one way. Mm. Another way is to use recovery software, um, sort of clone the disk into an ISO file. There's various tools for doing this. There's a tool for Windows 
called iso buster there's another one called unstoppable copier iso buster is a free trial and a 30 dollar pro version mm. unstoppable copier that's free um mac os has disk utility which will create an image of a disk for you no problem linux has dd rescue which mm. again will do the same thing uh uh, now, I, I don't know about you. I've still got loads of stuff on disc, on optical disc, which I would like to get off. I'm not talking about films and TV. I'm talking about data. I'm talking about you know, work that I did, stories, crap that I downloaded off the internet, like <laughs> Doctor Who sound effects, nonsense like that. What about you? Have you managed to already get your stuff off optical disc? I've got most of it off these days, I've got to say, yeah. Um during my first big house move, I, I purged a lot. I went digital with it. But I've still got stuff like my, my uni dissertation and like all of my work that I did basically before university and any jobs that I had and all that sort of stuff. So it turns out you used quite a lot of disks back in the day because, as I was saying, data is cheap now, but it wasn't back then. You know, I remember getting to university and I still had a – laptop with a three and a half inch floppy drive and right. i needed to copy something out of it it didn't have a usb port it still was that it was that old wow yeah yeah it was that old and uh walking around the rooms in the in the halls i was living in knocking on each door and saying does anybody have a three and a half inch floppy <laughs> that i Whoa. can borrow and the amount of people i met that didn't even know what one was so i was like wow this is this is pretty scary um on both accounts not knowing what it was and me not being able to get my data off the computer in any way so um that'll learn me for going with a with a very old old computer i'd forgotten the days before usb existed yeah it's so easy now so simple but yeah three and a half inch floppy disks at university yeah and from DVDs and CDs to headphones, which obviously are completely unrelated, except for the fact that it'll be myself talking to you, Gavin Phillips, once again, on this time on the various ways that you can remove a broken headphone jack from a phone or tablet and make basically make it usable again. Have you ever broken a headphone jack and found that the uh, important part was stuck in your phone or tablet or MP3 player, leaving you unable to listen to music. Oh, God, that must be absolutely horrendous. Have you done yeah. that? Uh, I haven't. I know a uh, small chap who has, and <laughs> it was a real pain to sort out. <laughs> oh, oh, God. Yeah, there, uh, that seems pretty horrendous. Yeah, because basically... Uh, once the headphone jack goes in, then there's no audio. It's piped through the ears. And yeah. if it gets broken off in there, if you can't get it out, then it's basically going to cut out the speakers on the device, thinking that the audio is going through the connector in the earphone. So there are various ways that you can get a broken headphone jack out of the um, port. I'm going to go through them quickly. In turn, I'm going to tell you what I found worked the best. And then, obviously, the uh, link's in the show notes for further information. So, you can use the inside of a biro. So, you take out the... Open a biro pen, pull out the, the, the nib end, and you've got the tube with the, with the ink in it. It's the same diameter as a headphone jack, or more or less. So, the idea is that you can push it down and then pull it out. It doesn't always work. So, another thing you can do is uh, a similar thing, but with super glue on the end but you don't put it straight down you wait for the super glue to go a bit tacky you can also use a thumbtack with a bent point but this depends on how far down the jack is if it's kind of broken sort of more or less cleanly with the edge of your phone or tablet or mp3 player then a thumbtack with a slightly bent edge a uh, bent point can be forced in to the end of the jack and then hopefully you get enough purchase to then pull it out. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, if super glue isn't available, then hot glue on like a thumb on, on a, a toothpick or something else narrow and long, maybe a lollipop stick, uh, can do a similar job. A heated paper clip. This is. I'm not keen on this. Um, this is one of the things I tried, and I got a little burn from it. So, you know, do this with absolute care. Is um, 
heat up a paper clip and then push it into the end of the connector and the the so like the the seal plasticky bit in the end there um should give slightly and leave the paper clip in there for a moment or two for it all to cool down and then pull hopefully it'll come out now the thing i found that did work was the um hot glue and toothpick by use a lollipop stick ah, okay um but it, it took about six attempts and I seem to recall that there was a bit of um, shaking of things and holding it upside down just to get the extra bonus of gravity. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but there is a tool called a grip stick. You could save yourself a lot of mess around just buying a grip stick, which is designed specifically for removing headphone jacks from a phone. All right. Wow. And now... These are available. They're not too expensive. They're the result of a successful Kickstarter campaign. And they've um, kind of been copied. So, um, you know, anyone can get hold of one now. I'm looking on Amazon now. And, yeah, you can, you, mean, you can get tools that do the same sort of thing. The original grip stick is ridiculously expensive now, so they must have come to the end of the run and they're very rare to get hold of. Um, but they were, they were like 10 quid when they were initially available. So, but, but, but basically the, the idea is to find something that is wide enough to grab whilst being small enough not to, to, to go in and not mm. to cause any damage. So it is a pain. The best solution, of course, is to not use, tradition, not use wired headsets, use, the, use Bluetooth. I really hope you've enjoyed this week's collection of top DIY tech tricks, tips and project ideas that were brought to you over the past few years on the Really Useful Podcast. Until next time, from all of us at the Really Useful Podcast from MakeUseOf.com, it's goodbye. Goodbye.